Good morning. Welcome to the ABC's coverage of Anzac Day commemorations in the Northern Territory. I'm Melissa McKay. We're broadcasting this morning across ABC TV, local radio and Facebook Live platforms for coverage of the Street Parade, which is just about to get underway in the Darwin CBD. I'm joined this morning by Dr Norman Cramp, a military historian who runs the Darwin Military Museum. Norm, good morning and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning, Melissa, and thank you for having me along. It's really, really great to have you here to, to help us uh, unpack what we're about to see um, and who we're about to see marching down uh, Nucky Street and through the CBD. It looks like we're starting to get um, a lot of people lining the streets there, a lot of people that have probably come uh, from the dawn service that you were at this morning. Yeah, it was um, a, a huge crowd at the dawn service at the Cenotaph this morning. I, I would think um, it would have to go close to being a record crowd and it's um, it's so good to see that there are so many uh, families that uh, parents are bringing their children along to pay their respects and to uh, commemorate those Australians that have given their all. It's uh, And I think the crowd uh, in the CBD is going to be equally as large. Absolutely, it's, it is really great to see so many people down and we can just start to see now um, the march looks like it's just about to kick off. Uh, we can see the police sort of leading uh, leading the march through as it as it comes across down Nucky Street. Yeah, well the uh, the march marshals today are Captain um, JJ Ronchevich, retired. Um, he has uh, his offside is in Lynn Hillock, and um, Paul Smith and Warrant Officer Alan Lewis. Um, as the parade's um, just moving off now, we're seeing the police uh, leading and uh, guarding the parade. Um, followed by Jeanette Wilson with her whaler horse. Um, the horse has uh, been in the parade every year for it would be the last 10 or so years, but this um, horse is the, uh, the third of the, um, of the whalers that um, she has uh, brought out. Willie Noble Ravelli is um, his name. Uh, they're a beautiful uh, horse, they're, um, uh, their nature, uh, they're so friendly, they're, um, they're, they're quite incredible and uh, being centre stage uh, doesn't, doesn't, bother, doesn't bother him at all. Absolutely and it's great to see, um, we can see on, on the uh, side of, of the horse there are a pair of riding boots that are worn backwards and we know that this uh, is a traditional mark of respect for, uh, for fallen horsemen. Yeah, uh, correct, and um, uh, all of the saddlery that um, uh, Jeanette has um, on Ravelli is um, original First World War or Second World War, uh, so it's uh, very, very important. Um, coming behind um, uh, Jeanette and the whaler, uh, um, the, the World War II vehicles, uh, they're all uh, presented by the uh, members of the Motor Vehicle Enthusiast Club out at the Qantas hangar. This year they're um, transporting a 98-year-old Colin Hurd, who was a fighter pilot um, with 82 Squadron in the Second World War. So it's wonderful to see them, all the vehicles there, uh, carrying the, uh, the veterans that are a little uh, infirm, can't uh, probably do the whole walk, uh, the whole march themselves. So, um, and the lead, the lead Jeep, is um, driven by the president of the uh, the club, uh, Pete Menzies. So it's great to see. We can see a lot of uh, young children there uh, lining the streets as well, um, waving flags and and watching everyone uh, coming past them. There we have um, the administrator of the Northern Territory, uh, Huey, uh, alongside of the Lord Mayor, taking the salute and um, Captain Moses uh, Rodino from the Royal Australian Navy. Here come the... Uh... 
And joining us now, we welcome our listeners on ABC Radio Darwin. Uh, tuning in for the parade down Nucky Street, the march has just kicked off on this Anzac Day morning. I'm Melissa McKay. I'm joined by military historian Dr Norman Crank, who is uh, taking us through what we are hearing and seeing um, through Nucky Street now. We've got the Darwin City Brass Band uh, coming through the parade now. Their musical director is Craig McGiffin. Uh, they've got Ron Roberts on the drums. This is the um, brass band that was formed back in 1981. And behind them there we can see Norm, the uh, Darwin RSL sub-branch and moving through there as well. Yeah, well, just uh, before the Darwin uh, band, there was the, um, the Gallipoli torch, uh, and behind the Gallipoli torch were the flag bearers of the three flags that were uh, at Gallipoli, Australia, New Zealand and Great Britain. Before or leading the, um, just ahead of the RSL contingent is the legacy contingent. It's led by Scott Perkins, the president, and it's uh, Legacy's 100th birthday this year. And so they have pride of place in the parade uh, this year. Um, the Darwin RSL sub-branch, uh, as you say, uh, the RSL was established in 1917. It's um, the contingent is led by uh, Colonel Jeff Dunn, OAM, CSM, RFD, retired. Jeff is the patron of the Darwin um, RSL and was a former president of the Royal Australian Artillery Association. The veterans that are marching with the, uh, the RSL contingent are from um, uh, conflicts, um, Vietnam, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Solomons, East Timor. As you see, they, they're not in uniform, but they proudly wear their medals. Uh, a lot of them have been in peacekeeping uh, organisations or peacekeeping forces, I should say. And it's good to see that some of them have brought their children and their grandchildren along to march with them. Absolutely, it is uh, important and, and really lovely to see um, so many young people taking part in, in Anzac Day commemorations, particularly those there that are yeah, walking with their parents or grandparents. It's good to see they've uh, all still got their uh, their march in them. It doesn't look like that is something that uh, that fades regardless of how long you might have been out of the military for. No, I don't think so. And uh, right behind the RSL was the 5-7 uh, battalion contingent, uh, followed by the Ramey contingent. Ramey, of course, standing for the Royal Australian uh, Army Electrical Mechanical Engineers. Um, they're the guys that um, keep everything in the Army running. Then we have the North Force contingent. Um, North Force, of course, uh, grew from the Nakaroos, the North Australian Observation Units in the Second World War. Uh, they had a patrolling mission across the top of, the, of Australia during the Second World War. And uh, North Force, as you know, now is the, uh, the reserve, uh, Army Reserve in the, in the north of Australia, from Western Australia right through to Queensland. Quite a, quite a unique group, uh, North Force, that, that we've got here across, uh, across Northern Australia, the Northern Territory and, and from the Kimberleys as well. Yeah, absolutely, and um, uh, have a lot of Indigenous people in, uh, in North Force uh, serving uh, with the Army. Um, they have a, North Force has a proud tradition, um, and so it just continues to grow. I think they have something in the order of four or five hundred members now. So. We've just... Um, We've got the Navy uh, contingent coming through now. Those... Uh, yeah, the Navy contingent uh, made up of members from HMAS uh, Kunawara, but there are uh, a number of uh, warships in port um, and some of their um, their members, their crew members, are, are marching uh, today as well. Yeah, I think we're about to see uh, the jets coming coming through. They should be uh, giving us a fly pass. Here it now. comes. There it is. It will be making a, a lot of noise down there, I would imagine. No. There it is. 
around from here now. F-35 jet fighter from 75 Squadron based at uh, Tyndall. It will be flying at approximately 750 feet and uh, at approximately 550 kilometres an hour. So by my calculation, he should be back in Catherine in about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the quickest trip uh, from Darwin to Catherine that I think might be possible. It looks like uh, a lot of people have enjoyed that there. We've got the vehicles coming in now behind, uh, behind the Navy contingent there. Yeah. What are we looking at there, Norm? Can you tell well, us what, uh, what, these, uh, what these vehicles... Well, there's a, a variety of vehicles. I was told there was going to be um, something in the order of about uh, 30 different vehicles. But um, the one, the vehicle that was just on screen now is a, uh, a man, I think, um, and it was uh, towing um, a 105 millimetre howitzer. Um, we have um, Bushmasters uh, up the front. Um, they, I'm, I'm not an expert on all of the military vehicles, but everybody loves to see the, the big trucks and the big guns and things like that. And that so, they do. Bushmasters, of course, um, we know may played an important role in, in uh, Australia's work in, in the Middle East. Um, they've also been sent over more recently uh, to Ukraine um, as well. Yeah, and all of these vehicles that are on the display and the, um, the soldiers that are um, with them are from 1st Brigade that are based out at um, Robertson Barracks at Palmerston. They, uh, one brigade uh, covers um, uh, all, all uh, facets of the army up here from uh, artillery to infantry to armour to um, aviation and I think in a few minutes we'll probably see a couple of the Tiger helicopters from one brigade from 1st Aviation Regiment uh, zooming in uh, over the CBD. That we will. 1st Brigade uh, is of course commanded by Brigadier Nicholas Foxall uh, at the moment. Um, the 1st Brigade um, has been a part of every major conflict that um, Australia has been a part of. Um, since uh, since World War One, yeah, 1914, it was uh, it was formed. Mel, it and, was. Um, they have an incredible history. Um, their their battle honours and pennants uh, are far too many for us to mention here this morning. Absolutely, but, um, yeah, it was of course members of First Brigade that uh, that went ashore in uh, in Gallipoli. That's correct. In 1915, and so. It's um, yeah, quite quite an important brigade, and and you know it has a quite a big footprint um, in Darwin um, and across the Northern Territory. Of course, we know uh, First Brigade uh, is now split across Darwin and uh, and South Australia, but certainly has quite a big uh, and an important um, footprint in the Darwin community. Yeah, and uh, and growing. I understand the um, you know the number of um, members of the brigade continues to grow, and as you can see, th this would have to be the uh, the largest uh, parade of, um, of vehicles uh, in an Anzac Day parade in in Darwin ever, uh, and a whole whole range of them um, from big and small from armoured fighting vehicles to recovery vehicles to troop transports. Um, yeah, they have a, 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 an amazing array of, um, of vehicles. And as we said before, Ramey, the electrical mechanical engineers, are the guys that keep them all, and girls, that keep them all running. It looks like we've got uh, the, those Tiger helicopters that you mentioned before, Norm, coming over now is three of them uh, flying across Nuffy Street this morning. Not quite as loud as the F-35s that we saw earlier. No, there's um, these, uh, the Tiger, Tiger helicopters are um, from um, One Brigade, uh, First Aviation Regiment out at uh, Robertson Barracks. They're, um, they're led by Captain Emmett Burke and the regiment is currently commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Joel Domigan. 
I'm not too sure about the, I think they're, uh, they're flying at about 60 metres uh, in height, uh, Mel, and about 120 kilometres an hour. So they don't have to race back to Catherine, they're just going to Palmerston and um, touch down. But yeah, an amazing sight uh, to see them coming down Nucky Street and um, uh, an aerial view of the parade. We should do that one year. The ABC should arrange that um, uh, the commentators get to have a ride in a helicopter uh, to do the commentary. As you said, Norm, quite a number of, uh, of vehicles coming through and uh, down the parade this morning. I can only imagine uh, how exciting it must be for a lot of those uh, young people we're seeing on the streets there. Yeah, one of the... Um, uh, I haven't been able to pick out the vehicle or the vehicles, but um, there is a contingent from the... Um, the 1st Battalion Royal Gurkha Rifles in Darwin today for Anzac Day and they're being transported in one of the vehicles but as I said Mel, they, they're moving uh, reasonably quickly and it's, uh, it was a bit difficult to pick out just exactly which vehicle it was but um, yeah great, great to have them here, they're, uh, they're here doing exercises for the Australian Army and the US Marine Corps. Uh, as a part of our alliance um, and so yeah wonderful and to have them here and to welcome them to our um, uh, Anzac Parade. Absolutely and I'm sure we'll see uh, some representatives of the Marine Corps coming through uh, through the parade momentarily as well. Yeah, well, we have um, just um, rounding the corner and uh, coming down Nucky Street now is the, uh, the band from the 1st Brigade at uh, Robertson Barracks, uh, followed by the contingent from the Royal Australian Air Force. My father uh, served with the Royal Australian Air Force in the Second World War, and uh, these are his medals uh, that I'm, I'm proudly wearing today. The behind the uh, RAAF contingent and as we look up on the, the screen there we can see the, um, the large contingent of the United States uh, Marine Corps. Uh, the Marines are here uh, obviously as part of their um, rotation through the Northern Territory to do their training exercises with the Australian Army uh, and the Gurkhas this year. So yeah, they are. They continues to grow. It is. It is one of those. Uh, one of those. Uh, one of those um, deployments that is continuing to grow. Um, the U.S. Marines have been visiting Darwin for more than 10 years now, uh, and have grown to, to about two and a half thousand personnel uh, to take part in exercises all across the Northern Territory and. I believe through uh, Queensland and, and Western Australia as well over the next uh, over the next six months while they're here for the dry season. Must be nice to, to come in just for this the nice six months of the year. Uh, though I, I imagine that training uh, during the build-up wouldn't uh, wouldn't be all that comfortable. Well, we have quite a number of uh, the U.S. Marines come out to the uh, the military museum. Uh, I give uh, history talks. About the, about the bombing of Darwin and things like that, and I get to have the opportunity to chat to quite a few of them, and uh, I ask them, you know, what do you think of Darwin and Australia? And they say, uh, well, it's really hot out, hot and dusty, and there's plenty of flies out in the bush. But yeah, we they love it here. They uh, they think we're nice and friendly, and uh, I've been to America on ten separate occasions, and I can assure you, the Americans are nice and friendly towards us. So. It's, it's good to have them here, it, uh, and it's quite a large contingent that's uh, marching today. Absolutely, um, they're coming in behind um, the yeah. Royal Australian Air Force yes. contingent that we're seeing come down Matthew Street now. This is uh, 13 Squadron that are based here in Darwin. Um, they formed uh, back in 1940. 
um, have been were, were disbanded after after World War II, but reformed uh, back in 1989 as a reserve unit, uh, and have since become a permanent uh, Air Force unit again in 2010. Yeah, had a very close connection uh, with Darwin 13 Squadron all through the Second World War. Um, and it's good to see that the squadron has been reformed and they're, um, they're keeping the tradition and the history alive. And if I could just say, with uh, the RAF contingent going through, they have their puppy dogs with them, that their security true. dogs. Uh, and I say it every year, I love them from a distance. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'd want to tangle with one, but they, uh, uh, the dogs are just so well trained, their handlers just... Uh, really look after them. They are uh, an absolute uh, team and it's uh, good to see that uh, uh, the dogs are out there on parade as well. They're a vital part of, uh, of our defences and yeah, it's wonderful to see them there. Absolutely. One of the, uh, of course, anyone who lives in Darwin would be well acquainted uh, with the Air Force, particularly every couple of years when, uh, when exercise pitch black comes around. We can see the Marines coming in now. I think the, yeah, uh, their uh, commanding officer, um, uh, Colonel Sullivan, is um, there uh, just uh, near the saluting platform. Um, I'm not sure who's, um, who's leading uh, the march. It could be Lieutenant Colonel um, uh, Darnell. Um, but yeah, there's uh, quite a quite a large contingent and we see we see the Marines now um, with quite a number of the um, commemorative ceremonies uh, the bombing of Darwin or the USS Peary uh, service on the 19th of February the Battle of the Coral Sea uh, service and commemoration in May and it was really interesting uh, I think this is the first time you know, there was a, a US Marine on the cenotaph this morning as part of the catapult party that, that was great to see. I believe yeah. that um, this might have been the second year, actually, that we've oh, okay. had uh, that we've had a marine as part of the catafalque party. But it is um, it is great to see that um, you know the the marines, whilst they're visiting here in the Northern Territory, are uh, really taking part in, uh, in 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 the community and, and really getting involved in in some of the uh, Australian traditions. Obviously, Anzac Day isn't isn't commemorated over in the States, but um, you know, is, is an important day for, for Australians. Yeah, ab absolutely. And um, you know, Australia and America have uh, been allies um, you know, from 1917 uh, and close allies. We've uh, stood shoulder to shoulder uh, in uh, conflicts past. Uh, can only hope we don't have to do that in the future, but the, uh, the tradition, the military tradition between both our countries and uh, America has its, uh, its version of Anzac Day, as you know, Memorial Day, and uh, very much similar to what, what we do here. And so it's uh, good to see the Marines and the Navy, the, uh, the, the people marching in the black trousers and khaki shirts uh, from the US Navy, um, and the Marines, of course, in their, their blue trousers with the red stripe. That's uh, the differentiation. Um, the Marines, obviously, while they're here in the Northern Territory, will uh, be taking part in in all sorts of exercises over the next six months, yes, as, as they do every year. Um, they're, they're training with Australian soldiers. Uh, just seems to, to get bigger and and more advanced every year that they that they come around. All culminating with uh, with exercise Coolandong later in the year towards uh, sort of the end of their rotation as yeah. they as they finish off and. Um, and you know, start heading back, start heading back home after that one. Yeah, and I think it's becoming more and more important uh, that we do these training exercises together. Uh, nobody really knows what's out in the future, or I suspect some people probably know more than you and I, Mel. But, um, and I think these, uh, this rotation, uh, the majority of these Marines are out of Camp Pendleton in California. Uh, and they'll all be heading heading home in the, the next few months and um, we get ready for the next rotation. Well, welcome to the Northern Territory in the wet season. Absolutely. Here we have the contingent of the um, uh, Australian Cadet Forces. There's the, uh, the RAAF cadets uh, marching past uh, on the screen uh, as we speak. 
They're followed by the, uh, the Navy and then the, uh, the Army cadets. Good, good to see so many of our young people uh, interested and prepared to join the cadets. As uh, we were talking before, and my, my uh, military claim to fame, Mel, is that I served in the cadets at uh, Fairfield High School in Sydney. It was a long time ago. We had muskets in those days, I think. <laughs> I'm hardly <only> kidding. <laughs> It is, it is great to see so many, so many young people uh, taking part in, in the march as the cadets there. We've got lots of people watching from the sidelines as well. And as we see the, uh, the cadets start, to, the start to head further down, we've got the St John's cadets coming in. We're moving into the uh, civilian aspect of the march. We've got some young scouts. Uh, girl guides coming through now. As uh, as we move into the civilian part of the march, we will um, farewell our radio listeners on ABC Radio Darwin. Uh, thank you to those tuning in. Adam Steer will be with you now for the rest of the morning uh, until 11 o'clock. Um, but staying here on ABC TV and uh, on Facebook Live, we'll continue with the rest of the march here. We've got uh, scouts coming down now. Yeah, the scouts and the, the girl guides. Good, good to see them. They're there. Yeah, the scouts and the girl guides, they're um, our leaders of tomorrow and it's uh, good, good to see them out there on parade and um, commemorating all of the men and women from Australia that have served this wonderful country of ours. And so it's been a, uh, a big parade, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, not only uh, marching, but a lot of people uh, lining the streets. And as I said before, as the contingent swings into Cavanagh Street, Cavanagh Street will be lined exactly like Nucky Street. It's just, it's so wonderful to see so many people turn out to, uh, to remember those people that have uh, served um, previously uh, and are serving currently, and to see the, the young cadets and to know that some of them will probably go on to serve uh, sometime in the future. And still they're coming. They are. You will have uh, seen many a parade in your time, I'm sure. Norm, does it look like the crowd continues to, to grow over the years? Yeah, I think it does. And uh, as I said before, you know, the, um, the crowd at the dawn service at the Cenotaph this morning, I, I would be amazed if it wasn't a record. I, the number of people uh, that are lining uh, Nucky Street today, and you can see as the parade um, uh, finds its way down Nucky Street, the people are moving out onto the street, and there's just hundreds upon hundreds of them. Um, I, I think it gets bigger every year, and, um, and, and I think that's a wonderful thing. We, we need to remember our military history. Uh, there are big pieces of our military history that are, are missing. Uh, we don't tell the story all that well. But, um, but yeah, if I wasn't here with you today, I would be down there with uh, my World War II Jeep but, uh, and being a part of it. I, I think Anzac Day is probably uh, one of the most important days on the Australian um, calendar of events. And it's just gratifying to see that it is uh, growing in popularity. Absolutely, definitely uh, a very important day on Australia's calendar. And it looks like as that march uh, is, is wrapping up, it brings the uh, Anzac Day Parade to, uh, to an end. But before we go, some of our reporters have spent the past few weeks looking at the role that the Defence Force plays in the Northern Territory community. 
So first we're going to take a look at one of the Air Force's biggest training exercises that we mentioned just earlier. Every two years, the skies across the top end fill with the familiar roar of more than 100 military aircraft as Air Force pilots from all over the world take part in exercise pitch black. And after more than 40 years, the training has grown to one of the largest defence exercises in the country. I'm Air Commodore Tim Alsop. I was the commander for Exercise Pitch Black 2022. Well, the Northern Territory is pretty unique as a training environment. When you look at it from a global perspective, it's the size of a European nation. And that allows us to have the freedom to create challenging training scenarios that can involve uh, up to a hundred aircraft from around the world. Exercise Pitch Black is designed to test what we call high-end air combat power. So that's bringing together a very large number of uh, very advanced aircraft, fighter aircraft, strike aircraft, uh, aircraft that provide us command and control. And providing the crews with very challenging problems to solve. An example of that might be that we have a hostage situation where we need to get a special forces team in to recover them in a very hostile, fictional environment. And that means that they, they have to spend a day at least planning how to approach the problem, to safely get all the aircraft in, to recover the hostages and then to get out again safely. Community engagement for something like Pitch Black is absolutely crucial. Pitch Black is a part of Darwin and the Territory. I first saw Pitch Black when I was 12 and I actually was in Darwin with my father on a massive road trip from Melbourne. And that image of aircraft recovering back into land really, really stuck with me. We love coming up there because of the way we're received. We are looked after like, like family generally and we put a lot of effort into things like the open day and this time the Mindel Beach uh, display which is the biggest one we've done. Well, it'll be too early to reveal what's coming for Pitch Black uh, 24. I don't think we'll be seeing an expansion of the scale of Pitch Black. We've really got it to a size now that um, is very challenging, but is about as much, I think, as we can tackle to make sure that the, the training is effective uh, and safe. Some really incredible shots there, Norm, from uh, Exercise Pitch Black last year. I don't know about you, but I went down to, to the open day last year to have a look at um, all of the, the aircraft that had been uh, brought in from, from all over the country. And there was thousands upon thousands of people uh, down mm. there doing, doing the same. It's a huge day and uh, I've been along to just about every one of the open days and I was uh, fortunate to be down at Mindel Beach when they did the uh, the fly past and it was just incredible. I mean, these, these jets just go vertical, um, supersonic speeds and there are a couple doing barrel rolls and things like this. So they put on a, a fantastic display they, um, they make you feel really quite welcome when you're out on the base and as you heard the commander saying that all of the, uh, the crews that uh, come up here feel really quite welcome in Darwin and the Northern Territory and so it's good uh, to see that um, our allies uh, are here training with us and um, hopefully we won't have to ever put that training into any sort of, um, you know, real, to any real purpose. but. Um, I think the first time this year the Germans, uh, German Air Force, did, the Luftwaffe, yeah. was here. So, yeah, this yeah. was um, last year's Exercise Pitch Black was uh, the biggest one uh, that has that has ever run. And as um, as the commander just said, there they've probably reached their limit <laughs> for, uh, so. for that as big as they can get for Pitch Black. <laughs> but it is certainly, um, you know, it, it's a big um, it's a big moment on uh, on the Northern Territory's calendar, even if. You've got nothing to do with uh, with the defence force. It's certainly one that you can't miss um, when it when it comes through every every couple of years. So we've got mm. exercise pitch black uh, next year. We'll have a relatively quiet uh, dry season uh -huh. uh, this year um, before it it comes back next year. Well, at the open day uh, last year, um, the, the aircraft were parked wingtip to wingtip, 
and it just went the whole length of the uh, the runway out at the the RAF base. Um, some absolutely amazing pieces of machinery there, and you know these these guys um, and girls that fly them are so highly trained, and it's just um, it must be a just a thrill. To, to fly some of the jets, I mean, you would you you would sort of give your back teeth uh, to take a ride in one, I think, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. <laughs> well, I've I've certainly been lucky enough uh, to to get in um, an Osprey or two over oh, right. the last couple of years with the with the visiting Marines. Um, one of the perks of the job is uh, is getting to to go out and cover some of these exercises. Um, and so for me, I've uh, I've been able to to jump in in an Osprey uh, to head out with with the crews there. Um, I've certainly made uh, made my dad jealous. Dad's in the <laughs> army and, and hasn't ever been able to uh, to Hit get himself ride. into anything <laughs> like that. So uh, it is uh, it's a quite a treat um, for for us here. We yeah get to go out and, and meet a lot of these. Um, visiting personnel as well from from all over the world which is which is great to have yeah. them here well at, our, at the military muster at the uh, museum uh, last august the marines flew in an osprey out to east point landed it there and opened it up and everybody could climb in it and they were letting um letting children you know sit in the um in the pilot seats and all this sort of stuff they had uh, they brought out some marine riflemen with them and when the Osprey set down, the ramp went down and the, uh, uh, the riflemen went and set up a defensive perimeter uh, as if they would in a combat situation. And then they just took all their backpacks and that off, put it on the ground and just let everybody, the kids were putting on helmets and all this sort of stuff. Is just that the aircraft is just to see them land and take off, absolutely incredible. It is, it is incredible, and um, not to not to make you jealous or anything, Norm, but it is it is quite an interesting um, feeling in in those um, those Ospreys as we can see, you know, the the, the propellers move, and um, you can you can almost feel um, feel it sort of drop uh, momentarily as uh, as as it sort of goes from helicopter to to plane mode uh -huh. um which is which is quite an interesting feeling um but uh yeah really really special for for people to be able to to see these sorts of aircraft and and machinery um here in in darwin and, and in people's own mm -hmm. communities and be allowed to get Close up to them. That's Absolutely. The, uh, yeah. Not too sure it happens in too many other places of the world, actually. Yeah. So. We'll, uh, we'll move into um, another story now. Uh, it was among the darkest times for modern Australia when bombs rained down across the north and the nation's freedom was threatened by invading forces. Reporter Matt Garrick reports it's been 80 years since war came to the Northern Territory. Descendants believe that more needs to be done to stop these stories from fading away. A tropical island home, where the legacy of war still casts a long shadow. It was really um, scary. Not only other part of Australia was hit, also a small island called Millingenby was hit. Smoke rising from a bombed ship, buildings destroyed, planes wrecked. This year marks eight decades since the World War II bombing of Millen Gimby, which killed at least two people. One of multiple Japanese strikes on remote East Arnhem Land in 1943. When they saw the plane flying across the land, they hid it under the water. They think they were, they was gonna hit them. Australian troops were scattered across the northern frontier as the Japanese encroached on the nation. This retired teacher recounts how her mother was among those of the local Yungal population frightened for her life. She hid amongst the mangroves near the tower at a place called Garki. That's where they hid. It was really dark and then and the Japanese couldn't see them in the mangroves. Every February, the nation's leaders pay tribute to the hundreds lost in the bombing of Darwin, the deadliest World War II battle on Australian soil. 
But Darwin's bombing was one of dozens waged across the north during the war. From Broome to the Torres Strait, and some believe those stories aren't being properly told on a national level. My personal view is that it's one of the most significant historic facts in Australia's history. But unfortunately, uh, it seems to have been um, sort of put in the bottom drawer uh, since uh, 1942. It was a rude awakening to Australians. During wartime, the brutal raids on the north were played down to the southern public so as not to inspire panic. But this top-end historian believes there's no excuse for the stories to still be kept largely silent. And he says Canberra's war memorial should be doing more to preserve them. So we don't know why they're not telling the story. Uh, it's certainly, not, in my view, uh, not balanced. In a statement, the Australian War Memorial says it tells the story of Northern Australian war history and commemorates it in various ways, including two large permanent displays in the memorial's galleries. Descendants of those bombed in Millingimby don't want their stories to fade away. Just to give them alert, just in case something might happen again. A snapshot of the past to pass on for the next generation. Important uh, history there, Norm, as you were saying earlier, you know, how important it is that people don't forget some of these, uh, I guess, lesser known stories uh, in the Northern Territory and, and Australia's military history, particularly around the, the bombing of Darwin. Yeah, well, it would probably uh, come as a surprise to a lot of people to know that by far the majority of uh, visitors to the military museum, Australians in particular, know very, very little about what happened in the Northern Territory in the Second World War, and they know very little about the bombing of Darwin. Um, why it was kept a secret uh, after the 19th of February 1942, I think everybody can understand that. It was um, censorship and uh, the government taking control and um, keeping everything calm and getting ready for the pushback. But, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of stories uh, that haven't been told about what happened uh, in Darwin and um, uh, through the nearly two years of the Japanese raids. I mean, it wasn't just the two raids on the 19th of February. They they went from February 42 to November 1943. But even, you know, some of the information about the 19th of February is uh, people don't know that it was the, the exact uh, Japanese attack fleet that hit Pearl Harbor, that attacked Pearl Harbor, attacked Darwin. They were... Um, uh, they were experienced, uh, combat experienced uh, pilots of the same aircraft carriers, the same commanders, pretty much the same, same tactics. And we know now that the plan to um, bomb Darwin, to attack Darwin, had been issued by Yamamoto probably within a couple of weeks of the bombing of um, Pearl Harbor. He issued his uh, top secret order number 92 in which he directed his um, admirals and rear admirals to take the battle fleet uh, from Pearl Harbour and to station about 250 to 300 kilometres off the northwest coast of Darwin and um, to prepare to attack Darwin on the 19th of February. So, but even before then, you know, when we talk about the bombing of Darwin, no, nobody, hardly anybody, that knows about the sinking of the Japanese uh, submarine, the I-124, uh, on the 20th and the 21st of January uh, 1942, a month before the Japanese attacked us. And then they don't know that there were Japanese war crime trials here in Darwin in 1946, the only ones that were held anywhere in Australia, the only ones on Australian soil. So, you know, masses of stories to be told. Absolutely, there is certainly a lot, a lot to the Northern Territory's military history, and particularly when we talk about uh, the, the bombing of Darwin, that's another um, example of, of the Australian and, and particularly the United States uh, military alliance really, uh, really being solidified, mm. um, that we're still continuing to see um, in, in the marine rotations yes. uh, through, through the top end. Um, and as we were talking about before, with the Marines um, coming in and visiting Darwin each year, um, we've we've been able to uh, to get out and, and cover a lot of their their training exercises here 
in, in Darwin and, and on the outskirts of Darwin. And we might move uh, now to a story um, that we, we did with the Marines last year. And this is uh, more than a decade after their annual deployments started. The United States Marine Corps uh, undertakes crucial training exercises across the Northern Territory. But last year, there was one on the Tiwi Islands just north of Darwin. It was Exercise Darren Dara, a simulated embassy security exercise uh, for Marines who will likely one day be involved in securing or evacuating a US embassy compound. Uh, this training exercise last year was the first of its kind uh, run by that uh, rotation of United States Marines and it was a clear sign that the US has turned its focus to North Australia. At the entrance of a mock United States Embassy compound, young Marines are put to the test. Gate two, this is gate one. That mob is heading towards your way, so be advised and be on guard. At every United States Embassy in the world, Marines guard the compound. On Bathurst Island, just north of Darwin, they do the same in this simulated embassy protection and evacuation training scenario. While the compound is a little different, the aim of the game is the same. It's almost this exact operation Marines have been faced with time and time again. Last year in Kabul, as the war in Afghanistan came to a chaotic conclusion, a stark reminder of how important this preparation can be. We probably do some type of a uh, non-combatant evacuation about maybe once a year but we can always be called upon to do it and we never know when that time's gonna happen, so we have to be prepared when the time comes. Almost 24 hours a day for a week straight, despite searing midday heat and unseasonally damp evenings, the young Marines were challenged. What we wanna do is, is prod them and poke them over a couple of days and, and see if we can't get under their skin. Confronted with angry mobs, an unwanted intruder, suspicious packages and a suicide bomber. Each day the command team came together to dream up new ways to test them. And inserting role players and inserting that tension, it really gives them a really realistic perspective of like, hey, this could actually no shit happen. We kind of fun with it where we like play around, we start off very small um, and then build up and build up and then like no shit it gets like the worst case scenario and then how do you respond and we kill off their leadership or um, we take away comms and then they they have to deal with it. Two, one, up. With an average age of about 21, exercise Darren Dara forces young Marines to think on their feet, providing protection for US citizens without escalating tension outside of the gates. I had one Marine ask like, well, you know, do we engage? One, he's behind a fence, so no, he's a civilian. And two, I mean, you're trying to compare a, a rifle to a stick, right? So you have to understand the force you're using and the type of force, or if it is force, what they're using, um, which is, is a, it's hard. It's not easy to distinguish those in, in a split second. Learning to stay calm, an essential tool for every Marine. This is the 11th time the United States Marines have deployed to Darwin for a six-month training rotation. But for the first time, this group of Marines are the most ready they could be, meaning if the United States needed to respond to a crisis in the Indo-Pacific region, they could do it straight from here. With 5th Marine Regiment already being a standing regiment, uh, we were able to fall in on this mission as a, already a combat-credible MAGTAF. The forward deployment in Darwin or in Northern Australia really provides proximity into the region. Um, it provides a capacity uh, to leapfrog operations. So um, for want of a better term, it provides the US military with a forward operating base from which it can launch into the region. Do you need help, my friend? Around 2,000 United States Marines are now based in Darwin until around October, training alongside their Australian counterparts and other neighbouring nations. Experts say as tensions brew in the region and with ongoing US investment in logistics and infrastructure, the American footprint in the top end is only getting bigger. There's clear evidence that the US government is going to invest more ensuring that um, supply chains, 
defence logistics facilities are present in Northern Australia and ready to support a range of contingencies. As for whether American forces on Darwin's doorstep puts a bigger target on the top end, experts say it does the opposite. It provides a strong deterrent effect in terms of um, a very clear commitment from the Americans to the ANZUS alliance and the bilateral relationship between Australia and the US. An alliance dating back decades, here for decades to come. Hope so. That was one, um, as I said earlier, Norm is, you know, one we, we were very lucky to, uh, to head out with the Marines um, to, to be able to cover their exercises like that one. Um, exercise Darren Darra, as we just saw, is actually mm -hmm. one of the only um, training exercises that the Marines do here in Australia on their own. Everything oh, else okay. they, they tend to do with the uh, Australian forces, yes. but, but that one uh, was one they did uh, solely um, as, a, as a small contingent of, uh, of Marines over on, on the Tiwi Islands. Yeah, Bathurst Island. I was um, yeah, really uh, quite surprised. I thought they would have done the the uh, exercise um, uh, at Mount Bundy or somewhere yeah. like that, but yeah, well, spread it around, I guess. Absolutely, they tend to they tend to use um, all sorts of uh, training areas across um, the Northern Territory. I know for that exercise previously, they've um, they've done that simulation over in Nullumboy as well. Uh, so they really get to to see quite a lot of yeah. of North Australia while they're here. Very good. Um, and particularly on those uh, those those islands and and sort of those coastal areas, uh, kind of brings us into um, to Norforce territory, uh, as well as we were talking um, a little bit earlier about um, Norforce and its unique um, capabilities across across North Australia. Yeah, well, as we uh, mentioned before, you know, Norforce um, is. Um uh, has grown from the North Australian uh, observation units of the Second World War. They, um, the uh, the Nakaroos, they uh, nicknamed themselves. They were, as their name, it's an, an ungainly sort of name, the North Australian observation unit. But their um, their role, their task was to uh, observe, uh, to. Um, right across the top end of Australia from uh, Western Australia, right uh, Northern Territory into Queensland to to go out on patrol and look to see if there was any signs of uh, any Japanese incursion, uh, but also to to look for um, uh, downed uh, pilots or air crew uh, from aircraft that had uh, crashed or whatever. They, um, their base was uh, down near Manton Dam. Uh, they operated from out of there. The patrols were mostly uh, uh, on horseback. Uh, they relied uh, very heavily on the uh, the local Aboriginal population and the communities um, that spread out across the top end of Australia. Um, there was uh, one of the units in um, the uh, Nakaroos was the Special Reconnaissance um, uh, Unit, and they they uh, patrolled right across the top end of Australia almost endlessly. They would come back into port and they would change crews. They had uh, small uh, coastal boats and all this sort of stuff. So the role that they, um, uh, that they performed was really uh, vital. And as I say again, the, um, you know, with the Aboriginal um, uh, people uh, being involved, um, the soldiers were taught you know, better how to live off the land and uh, survive and not to sleep too close to waterways where there's big crocodiles live and all that sort of stuff. Definitely. So. It is one of those, uh, yeah, very unique um, and important um, parts of, of the Australian Army. And one mm. of our reporters has, has spent some time uh, looking into Norforce um, over the past couple of weeks. Um, and from that, we, we know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have protected their lands for thousands of years. And today they play a vital role in defending Australia's northern coastline. Family ties to defence are encouraging new generations to join the army and bring knowledge of country to bear on patrols. Lillian Rangia filed this report. Private Mary Ann Weiss's family has a proud and emotional legacy of military service. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
The Torres Strait Islander woman is in Darwin, along with a group of Indigenous soldiers, learning skills to surveil thousands of kilometres of land across northern Australia. She serves in the North West Mobile Force, or North Force, with her father. Because of him and my granddad, I would not be standing here today. In World War II, her grandfather defended his country in the Torres Strait Light Infantry Battalion, which marked its 80th anniversary this year. Just one of those things that I feel like he had to do because pr to protect country back up home. Australia's first peoples have been protecting country for tens of thousands of years and that didn't stop after colonisation or during international conflicts. I just have a huge number of Indigenous soldiers who can trace their connection back to their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers who served during World War II. Norforce draws on the legacy of two World War II militias that relied on Indigenous soldiers to patrol bush and coastal terrain. Many of its members come from top-end and outback communities, bringing knowledge of country. Pretty handy for us and to share it with non-Indigenous and other Indi Indigenous all around Australia. Yeah. Sort of mass, sort of things, what we do and how we live in the bush. Skills that are crucial on patrol. We seek to have Indigenous soldiers serve because we can't do our job without them. Family legacies with Defence are bringing more Indigenous Australians to Norforce, like Frank Mara from the NT community of Daly River, who decided to follow his brother's footsteps at the age of five. I said to myself, well, one, one day that's going to be me walking that road with uniform on. Lance Corporal Craig Norman served with his dad, brother and cousin brother. He got on real good at bush with us, yeah. <laughs> like back in Barolola, we don't stay in like side houses or when we're at bush and we're good to come back and sit down together then. You come across people who have been, probably would have met your people back in the time and stuff like that. Connecting with a legacy to protect country for generations to come. Another, as we were saying, important aspect uh, of the, the Australian Army and the, and the Australian Defence Force uh, here in the Northern Territory, Norm. This has been, um, you know, as, as we were saying, quite a, a significant Anzac Day just in terms of the number of people out uh, on the streets uh, this morning, both at the dawn service and, and um, watching the parade as well. I guess for, for you and, and your family, how important is uh, Anzac Day to, to really commemorate? Um, as I said before, I, personally I think it's probably the most important day on, the, uh, on Australia's uh, calendar of events. Uh, Australia and Australians have a rich military history. Um, we've never shirked our duty. Um, we stood shoulder to shoulder with the British uh, and the Americans, um, you know, for our own, our own freedom, but also the freedom of other people um, uh, quite often on the other side of the world. I mean, the First World War, even though uh, Australia's first action in the First World War was to take the German um, uh, radio stations uh, in German uh, New Guinea and um, Rabaul, but by far, the majority of fighting was in the Middle, of East, uh, the Middle East and uh, on the Western Front. So it's, it's our tradition, it's, it's our history. Um, I think it's all about um, commemorating you know, how much we value freedom, how, how much we value um, uh, to provide the ability for people to live in peace and to not be uh, persecuted. Um, Authoritarian um, uh, regimes will come and go, but if if we don't uh, defend our freedom, uh, then they will come, but they won't go. And that's I think Anzac Day to me is all about what my forebears uh, have done and what the serving uh, men and women uh, in the Australian Defence Forces are doing, and for the young people in the cadets and that coming through and you say, I think we're looking pretty good. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to be with us this morning, Norm. We really appreciate uh, your insights and, and your knowledge uh, to, to get us through the, the parade. And, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's important um, to, to hear some of, these, some of these stories. This is um, sort of coming towards the end of our, of our Anzac Day broadcast this morning, um, the end of the March uh, this morning as well. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and to our audiences at home for watching uh, along across TV, radio and uh, social media platforms. Thank you again to, uh, to you, Norm. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure.